Indonesia's kind of, for the want of a better word, opened up a little bit. And now uh, I think WSU is the third university to, from memory, to be kind of campusing. And I'll use that word broadly because there's different models. I think Monash University has a, a kind of bricks and mortar approach in in, uh, in Indonesia. Central Queensland University has a presence there. And Western Sydney, I think about 12 months ago, announced that they were walking down the path of this. Well, they've just announced that their first cohort of students has started and it, they started last week. So it's wonderful to see. Their campus is later located in Surabaya. So again, outside of Jakarta, which is nice to see. And they're going to run a, a full range of, of bachelor programs, etc. A range of bachelor programs. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of The Koala News, and I'm coming to you from Wajak Noongar Country over in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney. I'm the CEO of The Global Society. Dirk, winning has never felt quite so much like losing, has it? It certainly has not, Rob. That was uh, one of the quotes of the day from the third, the unexpected third day of Senate hearings last Friday. The surprise gift day. <laughs> The surprise gift day indeed. Probably since last time we uh, we got together and recorded, we weren't expecting a third day of hearings. So to see something announced, I kind of heard a, a little bit through sources and through Scuttlebutt. And then to see it actually announced and then it uh, it actually go ahead on Friday. Now, the significance of that is, is that that was actually the day the Senate committee was due to report the 6th of September. So they've added in an extra day and they've brought back a whole bunch of witnesses. And the story on the street is that a number of the senators were not happy with the department, well, with a number of the departments with testimonies from day two of the hearings. In particular, the fact that letters to university cap or letters to universities about their caps went out the day after the Senate hearing. And there was a specific line of questioning around what the departmental folks knew and when that might go out, and to which they played a very straight bat saying, well, senators, this is the government's call as to when it went out. Clearly, going out the next morning would mean that those letters would have had, would have been locked and loaded the night before, and those departmental folks were probably uh, letting a little bit of uh, air between the bat and the first pad, I'd say. Dirk, you're not suggesting that this was contrived. <laughs> I could never do that. I could never do that, Rob. But it certainly begs the, begs the question as to what we sometimes consider departments being inefficient. They have been superiorly efficient by being able to get those letters out the next morning. Some of the conversation got fiery, didn't it? I was reading in the Koala mm. some of the discourse. And once again, mate, thanks to you and Tracy Harris, particularly for doing all the heavy lifting, sitting through those hearings and breaking it down. But it seemed like there was a bit of tension between some of the senators and some of the staff members that were, were on the floor. I, I saw some of the commentary from Sarah Henderson, the yep. Liberal Party senator, who I don't think you could say it another way than ripped into some of the departmental staff. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I think at one point there was a suggestion that uh, that one departmental staff member probably couldn't do their job properly, which I think was retracted due to Senate rules. However, look, yeah, it, it's look, it's a really as we move through this process, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the podcast. But there's just there's an awful amount of chaos at the moment, an awful amount of mess, and there's an awful or there's not a, an amount of clarity on a whole bunch of issues. And I think from Henderson's point of view, you know, she's asking specific questions that will lead to clarity and are not getting clear answers on those. So, mate, you're right. There's a lot of people out there that are still scratching their heads. You know, one of which goes back to your question about your opening statement about winning has never felt so much like losing. That was a quote from Alec Webb, who is the chief executive or executive director of the RUN universities, the regional uh, university network. He used a really good example of Charles Sturt University. So Charles Sturt University actually has had their cap increased according to figures that have been released based on the data that the department had. However, Charles Sturt's in a very unique position in that prior to the pandemic, Charles Sturt had roughly around 3,000 commencements per year and their cap is now 1,000. Now, they've obviously drawn that back through COVID and they've maybe cleaned out, you know, cleaned house a little bit internally, but they're now trying to get back to 3,000 and they've got a cap of a thousand. So in that context, yeah, there's there's just some real some real interesting bits going on in that. The other one that I might bring in is uh, the Australian Catholic Uni. Chris Riley, who's a, who's a really good guy and, a, and you know a long long standing colleague, spoke to reduction of fifty five percent of this year's commencements 
at ACU. Incredible, because if you look at the data that's been released by the department, they've actually had an increase in their cap. And where all of this lies, and again, I think we spoke about this at the last uh, in our last podcast, was around the carve-outs. So they're talking about new overseas student commencements, and they're probably carving out a whole bunch of data. But for an institution to believe that they're 55% down on 2024, but using 2023 data, again, on, those, on the new methodology, it looks like they've had an increase in their caps. There's something really, I guess, fatally wrong in the process. And again, something that George Williams, the the Vice Chancellor at Western Sydney, pointed out again in terms of not having a consultation on the methodology, probably presuming or assuming that some of the things that the Minister had spoken about in terms of housing beds, in terms of of other areas would be taken off or factored into the methodology. They clearly weren't. So Western Sydney, I think from memory, often we had maybe uh, had a slight increase uh, in their cap, but only by a few, or, or maybe it was a slight reduction. But certainly they were expecting something very different. And again, that's where I think that confusion comes in, where there's an expectation of, of something to, to come down because you think you're in a certain position based on information that had come before and then being delivered something that was completely completely uh, different. Now, speaking to that, Faruqi, Senator Faruqi asked a question of the Department of Education and asked, was there specific consultations on the formula with providers? And the answer was no. And the response was that there's obviously a fixed number of places allocated across the sector and that the department didn't expect to get any valuable feedback in those conversations. And I think- Hence, hence it wasn't sought. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so there's there's essentially a fixed methodology that goes back to a certain point in time, and many around the sector are, use, are using the phrase kind of when the music stopped, because it doesn't take into account future growth aspirations, it doesn't take into account context of, of where you may be in a region, it doesn't take into account housing beds or the ability to bring housing beds online. So there's just this kind of what seems to be this fixed formula, we're going to do it from these dates, and depending on where an institution was in that, is what the outcome will be. And one of the analogies I've got in my head, and you being a Sydney side will probably get, understand this quite well. If you think back to you know, post-Super uh, League and when the, the competition came back together, there were a number of clubs axed out of the competition. And it almost feels like that. There were mergers, there were axings, and some of these clubs had very proud traditions and histories, but they were just at the bottom at the wrong point in time. And if you remember, and you certainly would remember this, South Sydney. South Sydney looked like being axed at one point and it was only Russell Crowe and I think Holmes of Court came in and, and there were marches in the streets and South Sydney was saved. But like, they were under the, the executioner's guillotine there for, for quite some time. And it kind of feels a bit like that at the moment. Depending on where you are at the moment, depends on what your future growth at aspirations or what the government will allow you to grow by, which is interesting. It's an interesting analogy, the sort of rugby league one. On my side, I was a supporter of one of those clubs back in the 1990s oh, when... Tell me it's the Bears. League. It wasn't the Bears. Oh. It was the Western Sydney Magpies. Man. Oh, the and Maggies. The Maggies, the Maggie Magpies. The Bears were my second, second team. Oh. Both of them got... Yeah, I mean, they ended up merging the Bears with Manly. Oh. And uh, Western Suburbs with the Balmain Tigers. Oh. And you know what happened? I stopped following rugby league. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Isn't <laughs> you know, you know they they tanked rugby league for me, and here same sort of thing is tanking international education. One of the things that jumps to mind, Dirk, I was reading one of Tracy Harris's articles in the Koala earlier in the week, and she was talking about how one of the statements from the department was that they'd done thousands or a thousand consultations, yeah. and Tracy made made the comment: notice to departmental staff. One-way communication does not constitute <laughs> a consultation. Absolutely. Uh, so when you were watching it, did you kind of get this sense that the department feels like they have actually gone out and consulted on this? Look, my comment would be, I think, more in political. The more I've been involved in government and political, and that's across the spectrum, not just in education. Locally here, I was involved in a, commu- you know, in a community organisation where there was a redevelopment of a golf course. And found it a very similar approach. Consultation is being used for, we've told you, or we've sent you an email, or we've done something. Consultation, I think in government terms, now seems to mean we've engaged with you. It doesn't necessarily mean two-way dialogue, and it certainly doesn't mean that they've listened. 
Yeah, absolutely. Let's hope that that can be can be brought back. Uh, when I had Kent Anderson on a couple of weeks ago to talk about changes to the new Colombo plan, Kent was very optimistic. He was saying, look, consultation is one of those things that can be sort of brushed aside in the political sphere from time to time, but it's also one of those things that where the will is there can be also brought back very quickly. And obviously we need a lot of that right now. Yeah, and again, I think it comes down to that genuineness, right? So it's if there's a genuineness to seek feedback then consultation's a great thing because it, it really brings in the sector's approach. I remember Ian Aird of English Australia speaking a little bit about the difference between consultation a couple of years ago while they were coming up with a whole bunch of new things compared to the feeling of what it's like now. And it certainly is very different. So again, I mean, consistent with everything that we've, we've spoken about previously, I mean, this is not a bottom-up engineered issue. This is a top-down and, you know, it comes from Cabinet. It's a politically motivated issue that's rolling, that the snowball's rolling down the hill and it's picking up pace. And I actually feel really sorry for some departmental staff who are having to toe the line of the government. And that's what departmental staff do. They work for the government of the day and they're to deliver, whether it's good, bad or indifferent, the policy of the government of the day. And I would go so far as to say that even across ministries, there may not be the support for this as what may be wider thought. But while Cabinet sees this as an important ambition to lower the, the net overseas migration, then that trumps everything else. And, and we, will, we will see this continued. So I was talking with a staff member, an old colleague that is recently out of um, the public service, who basically said, thank Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just happened to leave when I did because this would have been utterly devastating to have to actually work on. And look, we, we are going to get to some positive news a little bit later in the podcast, but before we get to the good stuff, maybe let's let's sink deeper into the blackness of the black hole. Yeah, maybe absolutely. we can talk about the vet caps because if, if things were looking grim for higher ed, surely vet is just a catastrophic bloodbath. Yeah, mate, you're absolutely right. So let's start with the approach first. Within the Senate last Senate hearing, Senator Henderson asked for the university caps to be tabled, and they were. And five minutes after they were tabled, they were published by the committee. And I guess potentially opportunistic or diligently, um, I was keeping an eye on that and, and was able to get them out fairly quickly. And it's probably one of the largest LinkedIn posts that I've ever put out in terms of likes and in terms of following. So that's one thing. While the government has always said they'll release them publicly, it would be on their own time. And I think Henderson's forced that hand a little bit. So they're now public. What isn't public is vet caps. And the interesting thing about the approach here is that in the dying moments of the Senate committee, those vet letters started going out. So again, when we if we think about when university letters went out the day after the second hearing, and if we think about when the vet letters go out, literally as that Senate committee was wrapping up, you've got to say this is kind of being done under the, the kind of the dark cloak of night, which is sad. The thing that compounds it, it was a Friday afternoon, and it was roughly about 5.30 in the afternoon when letters start going out. And there were some providers that I'm aware of that didn't even receive their letter until after midnight on a Friday night. Now, I don't know about anything else, but I just think that's poor. Like, it's just poor practice. You know, if you're going to do something like that, cop it on the chin, stand behind it, rationalize it, and do do your job. But don't send them out, you know, to have an owner of a vet college receive a letter at 10 o'clock on a Friday night and be devastated all weekend with, with nowhere to go. But as these letters went out, more and more people either reached out to me or reached out to sources. Mate, utter dev devastation. I mean, we're talking about vet colleges that have been going for many, many years who are, maybe received an allocation of 10 or 3 or 20, lending them non-viable businesses as if they, you know, if this continues and if, if the bill passes in its current form and if these caps are actually embedded. Overall, I think up to this point, and, and I make the, the comment that this is released on Friday, we're recording on a Tuesday, so there's still a lot of information coming in at the moment, but this seems to be somewhere between a 50 and a 65% decrease, which is generally accepted across the sector. Now, again, when you when we take the ACU example in terms of growth or the CSU example in terms of growth, vet colleges are in the same situation. So we've had a number of new vet colleges come on board in the last 12 months. They seem to be affected the worst. So they're on the upswing. They've got you know growth ambitions over, say, a five-year period of being able to start attracting, I don't know, 500 students over a five-year period. But in that first year, they may have attracted 10 students. They've now got an allocation of about three. How do you run a business on three? When you're a startup, when you're starting out and you're seeking to build, it's not impossible. Those colleges that haven't recruited any students, but they started, seem to have a baseline of 30. So they're actually doing better than those colleges that may have been operating for 12 months, but are still on the upswing. 
And then there's established colleges. So the formula seems to, at this point, on the information that, that I've seen, favour those colleges who have gone gangbusters after COVID. So if you, and I don't want to say all colleges did this, but you know, if you pump prime the market and you offered lots of commissions to get students in the door straight away and you're doing everything you possibly can to get every bum on a seat, well, you might have had 1,200 commencements and you've been cut back to five or 600. You've still got a business. You're going to have to downsize, but you've still got a business. But for those colleges that have been around for a long time and sought sustainable growth post-COVID, mate, they're, they're devastated. They're in the same situation as Charles Sturt where you know, prior to COVID, they may have had 2,000 commencements. Now, or over the last couple of years, they may have built that up to three, 400 on the way back up to 2,000. But now they've got an allocation of maybe 80. And if they're capped at that, and that cap, and again, these are all the questions that are still unknown. What does that mean for 2026? So yeah, you've got 20 this year or 30 this year or 80 this year. You're going to get a 5% increase the year after? What does that managed growth actually look like and how do you sustain a business? So literally just published a uh, story um, bringing out a whole bunch of stuff. So we've got public listed companies that are in trading halts at the moment. Based on this, we have a number of colleges that are talking about closure. And within the last 24 hours, we've seen a major national operator put one of their Melbourne offerings or one of their Melbourne campuses on the market for leasing. So that's literally within 48 hours or 48 business hours of these of these announcements coming out or, or of these indicative caps being released. It's, um, I don't want to oversell it, but mate, there's this carnage out there at the moment. There's a lot of people not knowing what the future might look like. So vet in this country, not looking good at the moment. You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, gain insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. Just, just to speak to that a little, that's also the people who are incredibly decisive. When COVID happened and we moved, uh, my wife and I moved to close down our study abroad travel business. I mean, we moved three weeks before the border closed. So we saw it coming and we just thought, this is terminal and we just shut the business. So we were absolutely one of the first moving businesses. And you, you know, let's call it a travel business. There's still, there's still travel agents operating after the borders had closed and hoping that things were going to work out. And this is just the nature of management and being humans, hoping that somehow things are going to change even when you're staring a brick wall in the face. So what you're seeing is really the thin edge of the wedge there. All those operators that have made decisive decisions trying to get out as clean as they can. But but I dare say over the months ahead, there's going to be a lot more to come. Even I was speaking with a colleague of mine who works for one of the really excellent vocational providers, extremely reputable, been around for forever, have done things the right way always. And they're like a third down. Now, their cap is a third or, or 40% down. And they were just saying, what, what, like, what do we do? You know, what, and, and what are we supposed to do from, from here on? Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, 30, 40% down, they may still have a business, but it's a, it's a significantly downsized business. There will be probably staff layoffs. There will be consolidations where it needs to take place. The ones that I'm, that I kind of really, I don't want to say feel sorry. The, the ones where the devastating stories are the ones that are starting out. They've invested, I've seen numbers, yeah, yeah, like one and a half million into a site. They've got obligations for the next 10 years on leases and Mate, this isn't just, you know, wind up a business kind of, you know, I don't know, clean your hands and walk away. Yeah, a few people lose their jobs, whatever. Mate, they're bankrupt. Like they've got their obligations. They are filing for bankruptcy. It's heartbreaking. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, when you made the decision to do what you did, you know, they're all the things that, that hang over your head in terms of staff obligations. And I know, I remember reading at the time that you did it, you know, you, you looked after your staff as best you could. And you and you try and transition out of that, but yeah, the obligations that sit across, and if you've got debt that's sitting there, or you've got obligations, mate, it's not going to be. It's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture. And it says nothing, if I could be really frank, of our investment in skills for the future, in upskilling those industry or bringing in skills and upskilling them here 
for all the skills shortages that we are supposed to be having at the moment. And I just, I really, I just, you know, I, I really think we're cutting our nose off to spite our face and we are looking at something that is a short-term political thing without any any engagement in long-term strategy and setting this country up for productivity growth into the future because that's, you know, we're going to be, you know, you think getting your local Sparky out to fit a light bulb and, you know, them charging a thousand bucks is bad now. What's it going to be like in five years when there's no skills coming through? Yeah, exactly. And in fact, George William of WSU in his uh, session with the Senate hearing was saying that for every dollar received from international students, 24 cents of that goes to, to domestic students. And of course, that's a higher education, it's a university example, but the same is equally true of all of the really good quality vocational providers. So much of that infrastructure that's training our young people, filling those skills gaps, so much of that is reliant on this. And you said that it just is about to get completely torn up and it feels like the lost decade is coming up on us very quickly i mean there's just there's so many prisms or you know staying panes of a stained glass window to this conversation i mean in Stephen nagel from home has made a, a really good point as well in, in the senate hearing now, they've just all they just they have received a massive grant from the government to create a cyber security research center where does that go now so not only are you are you losing money but now you're losing grant money as well you may as well go down the bar and you know, peed it up against the wall. It's incredible how, how these things aren't being factored into conversations about where investment needs to take place and where sustainable businesses need to run. There we go. So um, party at homes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's where we're all heading. We're all heading there this Friday night. We're going to spend that cybersecurity money on the biggest blowout <laughs> party. I'm sure, Australian international I'm sure it's already been spent, but, uh, but yeah, it'd be good. Wouldn't it be good? <laughs> Mate, let's let's shift across to a bit of good news, yeah, can we? Australian Technology Network of Unis and, and its Global Graduates series. Tell, tell me a bit about this, mate. I, I love this. I, you know, I am. Yeah, if anyone the regular listens to this podcast will, will know that I'm a massive fan of promoting student success at wherever possible. And I think this campaign that they've done is a really, really smart one. So what it does, it focuses, I think, on six students, alum, one, I'm assuming one from each ATN member. It looks at their essentially their progress from graduating, and it's not just about you know contributing to here in Australia, but they've gone on to, to global success. And again, one of the factors that has been missing in this conversation, I think, is what is Australia's role in the portability of educational qualification and the portability of skills? And so to see you know graduates uh, come to Australia, finish up, graduate from the institution, and then be able to take that knowledge, take that learning and take their degree to other parts of the world and be successful. This is something we should be celebrating. And I think the ATN do it really, really well. So I, you know, Hats off, the doff of the cap to the ATN and Ant Bagshaw and the, and the guys there. They've done really, really well. And I think, you know, from a sector's point of view, this, these are the things that we need to be doing more of. If we're probably guilty of anything, we is not doing enough of this because it does increase the social license. It does absolutely talk to it. It's a skill enhancement. I was talking recently with James Martin from Insider Studios just about exactly this. You know, what captures the attention of people are, are great stories. And, you know, we, we do see those dripping out here and there and and what have you, but a concerted effort to, to increase that social license using these amazing stories that you and I and everyone across the sector are exposed to literally every day, I think would go a long way to increasing the support that we've got outside of you know, our immediate circle of friends. Mate, I agree 100%. I think the difficult thing is when times are, for the want of a better word, good, there's no ROI in a campaign like this. But when we get to places like this in the public discourse, we want to lean into that ROI and it's not there. Yeah, that's absolutely part of it. We, I think if there's anything that we've learned out of this, and I'm, I dare say that we will have short memories you know, in, in five years' time when things hopefully are better and, and all the rest, these things fall off again. And we need a constant, we need to almost have a, you know, a fund that, that constantly reinforces the good things that we do and we sometimes take that for granted so yeah couldn't agree more very very true my other thought around that is is around alumni and just how every dollar spent on engaging and communicating with alumni is a dollar well spent you know even though 80 percent of international students are heading home it does leave 20 percent who, who stay here just but building those communities and building those networks and building that narrative every one of those dollars i believe is is really well spent maybe to wrap us up some good news from Western Sydney in Indonesia. Yeah, so uh, as we've spoken about in the past, Indonesia's kind of, for the want of a better word, opened up a little bit. And uh, I think 
WSU is the third university to, from memory to be kind of campusing. And I'll use that word broadly because there's different models. I think Monash University has a, a kind of bricks and mortar approach in, in, uh, in Indonesia. Central Queensland University has a presence there. And Western Sydney, I think about 12 months ago, announced that they were walking down the path of this. Well, they've just announced that their first cohort of students has started and they started last week. So it's wonderful to see. The campus is later located in Surabaya, so again, outside of Jakarta, which is nice to see, and they're going to run a, a full range of, of bachelor programs, etc. a range of bachelor programs. So, but wonderful to see for Western, uh, wonderful to see for Australian University as we kind of enter into the, the TNE space into Indonesia and, and kind of enhance our footing there. And it's just, it's a really good news story. So congratulations to the folks at Western Sydney and um, wish them luck as they develop their campus there. You know, I'm not a gambling man, but if I were one to have a punt on something, I would be having a punt that we're going to see a lot more of activity in that space, in the uh, transnational space uh, over the sort of weeks and months and years ahead. Yeah, I think you're right. And look, one of the interesting things about the, the CAP proposal, and I'll call it a proposal at the moment because the bill hasn't passed, is this carve out on twinning programs. Even university, you know, I think we're going to see different models you know, evolve. You know, even universities starting potentially a diploma program offshore and then bringing them onshore and having them outside of the cap. You know, there's going to be a whole unique array of engagement offshore that we have not seen in the past, I would imagine. And you know what's interesting, Dirk? Once again, thinking long game, those individuals and organisations that have done those hard yards over the past, you know, years, decades, building relationships and the like and things are ticking along uh, are the ones that probably in the best position right now it just shows that you know it's always a good idea to invest in your relationships amen to that brother you never know when you're going to need them amen to that amen to that well as you said dirk we're recording this on a tuesday and likely to be published on friday morning so by the time you listen to this <laughs> there's probably been quite a lot of changes mm. and i think once that just shows how important it is for people to be subscribed to the koala news breaking news and everything you need to know all the analysis that really counts so if you haven't yet done so the koala news.com and actually even more than that the work you guys do on LinkedIn is fantastic. I love the fact that you're putting out those articles as they're coming up, as they're being published. So such an easy way just to stay right on top of the very latest breaking news. Um, make sure that you're getting on LinkedIn, hitting follow on the Koala news. Fantastic chatting as always, mate. And um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Time. Thank Look you for forward to it. Cheers, Rob. See you next time. Bye. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.